So welcome to today's introduction to organic chemistry. This is just going to be general background. I'm not sure they're going to have any organic chemistry on the AP exam, but this is just a general introduction that you need for your general background in chemistry. Chemistry is in general broken up into two groups, organic and inorganic chemistry. Organic chemistry was basically the chemistry of life. That is something that was in some fashion living. The inorganic chemistry was based on the stuff that was never alive, like rocks. And that was the origin. Eventually what it evolved into was that organic chemistry was the chemistry of compounds primarily based on carbon and hydrogen. We talk about hydrocarbons. And everything else being inorganic chemistry. The simplest of the hydrocarbons are just the alkanes. And they just consist of carbons and hydrogens and have the general formula CnH2n plus 2. If you have one carbon, it's methane. Two carbons, it's ethane. Three carbons, it's propane. Four carbons, it's butane. Five carbons, it's pentane. And after that, you simply use the Greek prefix to indicate the number of carbons. You indicate you have this as a side group by replacing the A-N-E with a Y-L. So ethane is the molecule. Ethyl is the side group. And what you can do with the alkanes is you can combine them with oxygen to produce carbon dioxide and water. Congratulations, you now know 99% of the chemistry of the alkanes. They are tend to be virtually inert. The carbon-carbon bond and the carbon-hydrogen bond are some of the strongest bonds in, car in chemistry, and so these tend to be very unreactive. Alternatively, you could pull one hydrogen off each end carbon, bring it around, and you get cycloalkanes. And that has the formula CnH2n. And guess what you can do with those? Yes, you can burn them to form carbon dioxide and water. The way you name alkanes is simple and straightforward. You simply stake, take the longest straight chain of carbons and give it its name. So this six carbon chain would be hexane. And then if you have branches off the sides, you name them by their group name, and you indicate which carbon they are on on the chain. And you always try to number the chain so that the side groups end at the lowest position possible. So we'd number our chain for this molecule from the right would be the number one. So one of the methyl groups is at the two position. One of the methyl groups is at the three position. So it would be 2,3-dimethylhexane. We noted the fact that if you pull a hydrogen off carbons at each end of the chain, you can bring the chain around to get a cyclo group. On the other hand, you could pull a hydrogen off two consecutive carbons and form a double bond, which brings us to the alkenes. The alkene, you take the alkane name, and you replace the A-N-E ending with an E-N-E ending to indicate that you have a double bond. And again, since you have a choice where that double bond could be in the chain, that is, you get a lot of isomers, you have to specify where it is in the chain. And the rule is you number the chain by the first lowest numbered carbon in the chain. So in our group here, it is the third carbon that starts the double bond, so this would be 3-hexene. We've jumped, made a short mention of isomers, and this is another isomer that the hexenes have. The position around each of those carbons is going to be sp2, so it's going to be a trigonal planar arrangement, which means we have a possibility, when it's in the middle of the chain, of having cis and trans isomers. That is where the chain continues down in the left for the chain, or when the chains continue both on the same side of the double bond. So we have cis and trans 3-hexene. We could take it a step further. We could pull two more hydrogens off those two carbons. And then we have a triple bond. 
and we have what is known as an alkyne. You'd indicate an alkyne by simply numbering the chain as before for an alkane, but you replace the A and E ending with Y and E instead. The Y and E indicates you have a triple bond, and again, you have to number the chain so that the first carbon of the triple bond ends up at the lowest position. So again, we have three hexine this time. And what can you do with a double bond? Well, basically, what you can do with a double bond is you can add something to it, something like HX. And in this case, one of the, the hydrogen ends up on one of the carbons in the original double bond, and X ends up on the other, and you have an alkane, which, again, is going to be basically chemically inert. Other than that, what you can do with the alkenes and the alkynes is burn them to produce carbon dioxide and water. So they have basically the same reaction chemistry as the alkanes do, except you can, in fact, add stuff at the double bond. An interesting exception to alkene chemistry is when you start out with a ring of six carbons. That would technically be cyclohexane. And you start pulling one hydrogen off each of the carbons to form double bonds. And you end up with this ring, which technically, left to itself, would be 135-cyclohexatriene. But in fact, those double bonds fuse together. And rather than having three single bonds, what you have is basically six multibonds. And this is known as an aromatic system. If you have six carbons, six hydrogens, it's known as a benzene, as a side group that's called a phenyl group, and is often abbreviated as a hexagon with a circle in it. And the main thing is, is the aromatics, again, go back to being very unreactive. The double bond is, in fact, not easily attackable. And again, any place where you see an aromatic ring, that part of the reaction of the compound is going to be highly unreactive. And this brings us to a point about organic chemistry. The alkanes basically have no reaction chemistry. The alkenes and the alkynes have very limited reaction chemistry. If you're going to get any variety of chemistry, you need to have something that is more electron rich than carbon or hydrogen available. Basically, you need some other elements to be present. And the two most other common elements that are present in organic compounds are oxygen and nitrogen. And we can add oxygen to our alkanes and alkynes by simply inserting it into one of the bonds. If we insert it between two of the carbons in the chain, we get what is known as an ether. If we insert it between a carbon-hydrogen bond in the molecule, we get what is known as an alcohol. The way you name an ether compound is you mention the name of the two side groups that are present on the oxygen, and then simply say ether. So this compound, which has an ethyl group on each side of the oxygen, would simply be diethyl ether. The ethers tend to be slightly polar. The, the oxygen is more electronegative than the carbons, but the angle between those two is about 100, 110 or so degrees, and so it's only slightly polar, and the longer the chains are on the sides, the less polar it's going to be. On the other hand, that oxygen-carbon bonds are somewhat vulnerable, so we see chemistry where the ether molecules are broken up at the oxygen-carbon bonds. For the alcohols, the alcohols, in addition to being polar, are also going to have hydrogen bonding available. The way you name an alcohol is you simply name it as the alkane that it would come from, and then change the final E to an OL. And so butane becomes butanol when one of the when we add the OH group to it. And again, we have a possibility of isomers, 
and so you have to indicate where the OH group is on the chain. In this case, 1-butanol. If it were on the second carbon, it would be 2-butanol. And like we said, the OH group is going to be polar, and it's going to be hydrogen bonding. And so that's going to affect its solubility to a large extent. In addition to forming two single bonds, oxygen, of course, is capable of forming double bonds. And of course, it'd have to form the double bonds to one of the carbons, since that would use up all the oxygen's bonding. If the double bonded oxygen is bonded to one of the carbons in the middle of the chain, you get what is known as the ketone. If it's bonded to the carbon at the end of the chain, you get what is known as an aldehyde. The way you name the aldehyde is simple. You simply take, again, the alkane name, and in this case, you change the final E to an Al. So it would be butane with a double bond oxygen at the end. It is butanal. Something similar for the ketone except instead of changing the E to Al, you change it to O and E. And so butane becomes butanone. And usually you have to indicate where on the chain that double bond in the middle is. In this case, of course, the number two position is the only position possible for the ketone. Again, the carbon-oxygen bond is going to be polar and so that's going to affect the solubility and reactivity of those as well. The third possibility is you can have both a double bonded and a single bonded oxygen on the same carbon. If you have the double bonded and single bonded oxygen on the same carbon and it's the end, you get what is known as an acid group. COOH is known as a carboxylic acid group. You indicate that you have this group on the end by replacing the final E with oic acid. So our acid would be butanoic acid. And this is going to be a weak acid. The carboxylic acid group is capable of donating its proton. So anytime you see that group on an organic compound, it's in fact going to be a weak acid. Alternatively, you could have it in the middle of the chain, and that becomes what is known as an ester. The way you name an ester is you aim the side group on the oxygen side first, and then you name the remaining thing as a derivative of the acid. You replace the final ICA acid on with ATE, and so our group would now be, since the methyl is the one on the oxygen, it's a methyl group. We'd have a three carbon chain, which as an acid would be propanoic acid. And so it becomes, we replace the IC with acid with ATE. And so that would be methyl propanoate ester. Again, the oxygen part of it's going to be polar, and that's going to affect its chemistry. The other common element we run into frequently in organic chemistry is nitrogen. Organic compounds that include nitrogen are known as amines. And basically, you name them as derivatives of ammonia. Just like the ethers, you simply name the side groups that are attached to the nitrogen, and then they add the term amine. So this compound would be ethyl methyl amine. Again, the nitrogen is more electronegative than carbon, and so they're going to be polar bonds, so they're going to tend to be polar. And they have a lone pair available, which is a very good Lewis base. And so, free, so all the amines are going to be weak bases in solution. They'll make the solution basic. In addition, if the nitrogen happens to have one or more hydrogens on it, it's not only going to be polar, it's going to be capable of hydrogen bonding as well, which again is going to affect its solubility. And that concludes today's discussion of organic chemistry. Have a nice day.